you would open to John chapter 10, please, with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity again where we can gather and open up your word, Lord. And as we look at John 10 and Christ's work as the shepherd and his heart for the nations, Lord, his heart for his sheep among the world, I pray that you would give us that same heart. Please, Lord, your spirit, we ask to go forth among our hearts and conform us into the image of Christ and give us his very heart for the nations as well. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, it seems I can't get out of the book of John. I preached up here a year ago from John chapter 6. I was saved in a passage from John 15 seven years ago, and now the college group is going through the book of John together. And the book of John just has a special place in my heart, and John 10 has been on my heart over the last several months. And so I just wanted to bring my heart to you today with this text. We're going to be looking specifically at John chapter 10, verse 16. Um, But before we get into that verse, I just want to set the context. And to know the context of John chapter 10, you really need to start in John chapter 9. Christ is in Jerusalem for one of the Jewish Jewish festivals, and he comes across a man who was born blind. And the, the disciples ask him, was this man born blind because of his parents' sin or because of his sin? And Christ responds, he says, he wasn't born blind because of either of these things, but he was born blind so that God's glory could be put on display. And he reaches down, and he spits in the mud, and he puts mud on the man's eyes, and he tells him to go and come back after washing. And as the man goes and washes his eyes, his sight is healed. Long story short, this man is brought before the Pharisees, the supposed spiritual leaders of the flock of Israel, in order to investigate his claims. And rather than believing this miraculous event, the Pharisees get angry at him and they throw him out of their presence. Rather than shepherding his heart to this Messiah who healed him, they reject his testimony and they kick him out of their midst. Jesus returns again to this man after he has been kicked out. And rather than just giving him physical sight, this time he gives him spiritual sight. And this man sees Christ for who he is and he worships him. John chapter 10 is Christ's response to the self centered, wicked, death bringing shepherding of the Pharisees. He's going to use an analogy of a flock and a shepherd, and he's going to call himself the good shepherd. And where the human leaders over Israel failed, Christ asserts his superiority as one who cares for and protects and knows and nourishes and loves his sheep. The greatest of these contrasts comes in verse 10, where the good shepherd is going to declare that he would be willing to lay down his life to save his flock. And this is exactly what he does as he bore the wrath reserved for the sheep from God in order to save them from the eternal torment and death away from the presence of God. But this morning, I want to look at what Christ says in verse 16, a particular verse in this passage that stuck out to me. He kind of just slips it in between a declaration of his death and a declaration of his resurrection. But I think it is of utmost importance. John chapter 10, verse 16, Christ says this. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice they will become one flock with one shepherd. Christ didn't just lay down his life arbitrarily for no purpose, but behind his action lies a very specific intent with a very specific heart. Christ lays down his life not just to save the sheep around him, but to save all of his sheep who are all over the world. He has a heart for his sheep, one that desires to gather them all in and care for them in a way that only he could, and in so doing, glorify his work as the good shepherd. But in order to care for all of his sheep, he must gather them unto himself. And so this morning, I wanted to look at the work of Christ as he gathers his sheep, specifically our place in Christ's work as he gathers his sheep, our place in the work of evangelism and missions For our purposes today, I want to distinguish between those two. When I say evangelism, I mean sharing the gospel with anyone at any time, anywhere. Normally in your own culture. And when I say missions, I mean evangelism outside of your culture. Going to a different people. So that to them, someone is coming with the news. So you have different definitions of that. Just work with mine for me this morning. That's what I mean when I use those terms this morning. Before we get into the text itself, I wanted to discuss some reasons for missions that are not in the text. 
I think all of these are great reasons. The first is this. The gospel brings order to chaos in hearts and in families and societies where the world and the ravages of sin has destroyed it. And it does this in a way that no other world system can. The orderliness of the Western world is largely in part due to the gospel's effect on us. The effects of the gospel on our hearts and the proliferation of biblical thinking among the people. It may not look like that right now as the country kind of descends away from God, but the gospel causes lives to flourish. And so that is a good desire to take the gospel to the world. It causes lives to flourish. The second is this. God is moving mightily among other people groups in the world. While his blessing may be leaving America, as we pursue our own sin and selfishness, along with much of the Western world, his work is exploding in the global south. It would be South America, Central America, Africa, Asia. There's a quote. I didn't write down who wrote it. The number of practicing Christians in China may be approaching the number in the United States. Last Sunday, more Presbyterians were in church in Ghana than in Scotland. The Christian church has experienced a larger geographical redistribution in the last 50 years than in any comparable period in history, with the exception of the earliest years of church history. I think it's only natural to want to be a part of that. God is moving among other people. I want to be in on that. I want to be where God is moving. The last of these, I think, is probably the most profound, and that is the desire to reach the lost with the gospel for the sake of their souls. Specifically, the areas of the world where there is little Christian presence or even none at all. Billions of people are living and dying, having never heard the name of Jesus Christ. The greatest of these being the 1040 window on the other side of the globe, where nearly 100,000 people die every single day, never having heard a whisper of the gospel. I just want you to hear some statistics on this so you can know how staggering this number is. I got these from Joshua Project and finishing the task. Joshua Project says this. I looked these up on Wednesday. There are 17,009 people groups in the world. 7,079 of them are unreached. That is, there is not enough indigenous Christians there to evangelize the community without outside help. There's not enough natives there to evangelize the people, without the church sending help. This number makes up 42% of the world's entire population. 86% of these unreached people live inside the 1040 window. This number consists of a mind-boggling 3.14 billion people. I'd encourage you to go to Joshua Project's website. They, They have this interesting map where they've got a red dot, a light red dot for every unreached people group. And you look in the 1040 window and it gets darker and darker as more red dots appear. And you get to India, and India is almost black. 1.2 billion people alone unreached in India. Finishingthetask.com records another statistic, the unengaged, of these 7,079 unreached people. 1,061 of them have no one even trying to engage them. No one. These places are not unreached. This is important to know this. These places are not unreached because it has been difficult for God to reach them. But because of the difficulty of breaking into the cultures with the gospel and the burden of sacrifice that often accompanies the missionaries willing to go there, most of them that try give up. I could not believe these numbers the first time I had heard them. Our hearts should break for the numbers of the lost. Our hearts should burn for them to be reached. All of these reasons are valid reasons for missions, but I don't believe they are the preeminent reason, and I don't believe it's the reason given in our text today. And so we're going to look at three components to this reason, but before we do, I just want to look at a phrase, the first part of the verse. John 10, verse 16 again. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Sheep not of this fold. And this might be self-explanatory, but I think it's worth our time to think about it. Christ was talking to the Jews here, and when he says, I have sheep not of this fold, he doesn't mean I have Jewish sheep that aren't here right now. What he means is I have sheep outside of the people of Israel. I have sheep that are not Jewish. 
If you were a first century Jew listening to this, you probably have two thoughts going on in your head. First is this. On the one hand, you'd be thinking, what? Other sheep? You mean Gentiles, Jesus? Those dirty Gentiles? And you want to bring them into the people of God to partake in our blessings and our promises? That's despicable. You think of Jonah's view of the Ninevites. He didn't want God to grant them repentance. Or you think of any of the Jews' view of the Samaritans and their mixed blood. Right? They'd be shocked for Christ to say this. I have sheep not of this fold. But on the other hand, this shouldn't have been a surprise at all. The plan of God has always been to include the nations, always been to offer them blessing. Even at the very beginning when the covenant was offered to Abraham, he said, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I think Psalm 67 is even more clear. If you would turn there with me real quick. Psalm 67 says this. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. This should not have been a surprise to any Jew that God would include the Gentiles in his promise. And for them, their mind would have been that they would have proselytized. They would have become a Jew ethnically. But in the gospel, this is a profound mystery that is far greater than what any Jew ever could have imagined. In Ephesians 3, Paul calls it the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. This has been God's plan from the beginning And he brings it about in a way that no Jew ever could have conceived. I think the first and most immediate application of this is this is talking about us, Southside. Any non-Jewish person in this room who has been redeemed, you were who Christ was talking about here. What a privilege Christ is talking about us. You were far off and he has brought us into the fold to care for us. But it could also be talking about the person next to you who has yet to respond to the gospel of Christ. And almost certainly, certainly, it is talking about people outside of these church doors. Countless numbers of souls who are sheep all over the world that will be brought into the flock of Christ. So this brings us to our first reason this morning for us to be involved in the Great Commission. This reason is this, the sheep belong to Jesus. They belong to him. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I have them. They are mine. They belong to me. The sheep are his possession. God is sovereign over his sheep because ultimately they belong to the Father. He created them. He owns them. And he's going to give them to Jesus Christ. This transaction, I don't think, is recorded anywhere better than John chapter 6 where we see a beautiful, beautiful gift given to the Son. This is what he says, Jesus says in John 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. No one, again, can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. I think we could spend an entire sermon discussing the meaning of that text alone, and I may hear no end of it from some of you, but I wanted to emphasize this morning one thing about that text. That is this, the sheep are given to Christ as a gift from the Father. So if you're thinking this morning, Hobie, I chose Christ, that's fine. I don't want to talk about that this morning. I want you to just stop and listen and accept this truth. You were a gift of love 
from the Father to his Son for his work on Calvary. And that's the only way you're getting to him is if you've been given to Jesus Christ. And now you belong to him, the most loving, caring shepherd that has ever existed. This is not something to fight. This is something to cherish. You were a gift to Jesus Christ. Look what he says next. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. This is an astounding statement. What could force Christ, the eternal God of the universe, to act? I must bring them. Why must you bring them? I think it's twofold. One, it was the eternal will of the Father to give Christ the sheep, as we just discussed. And in the same way that Christ joyfully receives the gift from the Father, he delights in doing the will of the Father. He delights in going out into the hearts of his sheep and gathering them into the fold. This is more than just a response, though, to the will of God. I think this is a declaration of the heart of our shepherd. Jesus Christ must go to his sheep because he loves them. He must go bring them because he loves them. This is a love so great that we see just a few verses prior that he is willing to lay down his life to save them. A love so great that he would leave his eternal glory with the Father and his and suffer the highest of prices to bring them into the fold. He didn't just come and buy us with gold or silver, but with the very blood of God, his blood, precious blood of the lamb. This was his work to bring them in positionally. This is what he did to secure the salvation of the sheep. But I think this message would miss its mark if we didn't talk about how does he bring them in practically? How does he do it in day-to-day life? In order to bring them, he must go to them. How does he go to them? Romans 10 tells us, this is a familiar passage probably for most of you. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. We are the means by which Christ goes to his sheep to bring them in. Our feet are blessed and beautiful because we bring the sheep and the shepherd together when we herald the good news. To participate in this mission should be weighty to every single one of us. We should not be lighthearted about this. This is an immeasurably serious task given to us. We would be lying if we said it was not daunting. There's much at stake with this task at hand. If we do not act, the sheep will not hear the message. They will not hear the voice of their shepherd calling to them, and we will bring shame upon the name of Christ. But if we do act, we carry the most important news the world will ever hear. And at much cost to ourselves. We've been spending so much time in Peter. If you wish to proclaim the glories of what God and Christ have done for you, you will suffer in this present world. You can expect it. Hobie, what if they ignore me? I can't go and share the gospel. What if they ignore me? What if they laugh at me? What if they mock me, persecute me, attack me? Those are all legitimate fears. Those things could happen to us, even in America. But if you leave America, it may be even worse. Some of you may sleep on dirt floors the rest of your life. Some of you may never feel air conditioning again. If you're a Coloradan and you've been to Florida, you know why that's a big deal. (laughs) Your children could die of sickness. Your wives could die in childbirth. Spiritual warfare to deter you like you never thought possible. You could have your families killed, yourself imprisoned and tortured until you yourself die. We could go on forever about the atrocities that will be done to the saints of God as they go into the darkest parts of the world. This is an immeasurable cost. This is not light. Look at what he says next, though. They will hear my voice. They will hear my voice. This is the most comforting and inspiring thing Christ could have promised. As we go out into the world and risk much of ourselves, we cannot 
fail. We cannot fail. The sheep will hear and follow their shepherd. His voice is irresistible to them. And every sheep who belongs to Jesus Christ will respond when they're called by God. Every single one of them. God is sovereign over the calling of his sheep. And they will respond when the time comes. It was this reformed belief in the sovereign calling of God that drove the modern missionary movement. John Elliott, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, William Carey, Mueller, Patton, Brainerd, C.T. Studd, David Livingstone, and Jim Elliott, all driven to great self-sacrifice by a confidence that Christ's sheep would respond to the call. I look at the Reformed Church today and I wonder, where did that zeal go? Where did that zeal for missions go? The present-day mission field is driven by those who disagree with Reformed theology. My college missionary friends mocked me with their common beliefs. Calvinists don't frequently engage in evangelism and missions because God will save the elect anyway. That's obviously wrong. But I think the observation is correct. We're not going. We don't go. And instead, we often resolve to enjoy our theology inside these church walls and keep the good shepherd to ourselves. Why don't we proclaim him? Why do we not go? He says, my sheep will hear my voice. There's nothing to fear. I ask that you pray this to yourself daily. Share the gospel with someone daily. Take the gospel boldly into places where it is of much cost to yourself. We are the mouthpieces of the Savior, and we can carry to the lost and hurting the voice of their salvation. What is your purpose in this, Jesus? What's your purpose in all this suffering? What's your purpose in coming to save the sheep? What do you want to accomplish in this? What is the result that's going to make this all worth it? I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock, one shepherd. A lot could be said here about this verse alone, but I'm just going to say this and then we're going to close. There is a unity that comes about in the flock of Jesus Christ as the gospel breaks down all cultural barriers, all national distinctions, all biases and hates. If there is a hatred in your heart that stops you from bringing the gospel to a people group, you need to ask God to remove that from you. You need to ask him why it's there. The gospel has no partiality. God will redeem a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation without distinction. The reason why this is true is because this text is not a call to evangelism and missions primarily for the sake of the sheep, primarily for their souls. This is a call to evangelism and missions primarily for the sake of Jesus Christ. It is about him. It is about his work as the good shepherd. And as he saves and redeems a people for his own inheritance, and they hear and savor him as their shepherd, he is proclaiming his greatness and his goodness among them. There's no division among the sheep, because the primary object of affection of all the sheep is the same, Jesus Christ. That a shepherd who loves them and died for them and rose for them is now glorified in their worship of him, as they are united in him. We must proclaim Christ for this cause. For him to be highlighted as the chief affection among the nations, among his sheep. This is the heart of Jesus Christ. And we united under him must have the same heart. J. Campbell White stated this beautifully. Most men are not satisfied with the permanent output of their lives. Nothing can wholly satisfy the life of Christ within his followers except the adoption of Christ's purpose towards the world he came to redeem. Those who put everything into Christ's undertaking are getting out of it, getting out of life its sweetest and most priceless rewards. In other words, if we wish to satisfy the deepest longings of our heart in Christ, we must long for the glory of Christ among the nations, for the worshiping and adoring of Christ among the nations as he brings his sheep into his fold. 
And certainly this would include our own back doors. But let me just plead with you this morning for a moment to consider something beyond our backyard. We as Americans have blessing and privilege to send missionaries and to go as missionaries like no culture in the history of the world. The amount of wealth we have is staggering. The ability to go and bring the gospel to the world is immeasurable compared to past eras in history. What are we doing hoarding this gospel? Why are we hoarding it? I think it's important to note this morning that God does not need our wealth, but he will use it if we offer it up to him. He will use it. Seven years ago, I was a freshman in college with the intent to go into the healthcare field, live very frugally and wise with my money, and retire at an early age, and God saved me. And initially, my desire was just to proclaim the word to the sheep. He gave me this desire to preach the word of God, to edify the saints. And as time grew, my heart was pulled more and more towards the nations. Two years ago, I met together with Nick Deckard and Skyler, my brother. We discovered that God had been pulling all of our hearts for missions. Could do nothing else. Couldn't imagine staying when our heart feels so called to go. And I know so many of you here in this room have that same heart, whether it be to go or to stay and support. South Africa, Kenya, North Africa, Mexico, Peru, the Philippines, China, Taiwan. There are many at Southside who are pursuing this call in their heart. But there are also some of you that are not. Some of you that do not have a heart for the, mission, for the missions and for the nations as of yet. John Piper said this once. He said, we are either zealous goers, we are zealous senders, or we're disobedient. I'm going to use those terms here real quick because I like them. I want you to get what I'm not saying. I'm not saying all of us can go. Obviously, that would be crazy. If all of us went, there'd be no one here to send us. It would be a very difficult path ahead of us. But I'd ask you this morning if you would consider it. Do you feel God calling you, tugging on your heart to go? Don't quench that leading of the Spirit. If people would try to talk you out of it, is this call of God? If this call is of God, you must go. Consider it. John Patton, missionary to the New Hebrides, an island full of cannibals, recalled this story when he was deciding whether or not he should go. A man from our church quickly ascended to me once and said, John, the cannibals, you cannot go. You will be eaten by cannibals. But to this, Patton responded, Sir, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in this great day, in the great day, my resurrection will body, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our Redeemer. Whether you stay or you go, the reward is the same. If people feel called to go, encourage them to go. If you feel called to go, pursue it. See if that is what God desires for your life. But if we're not goers, we need to be senders. We need to send those who are going. And I don't just mean financially. I know not all of us can support financially. I think most of us as Americans underestimate the value of our wealth. We can probably pinch corners and find ways to support missionaries financially. But what I mean when I say senders is that all of us should find somewhere in our lives where we can equip the saints who are going, whether it be financially or to use your spiritual gifts to encourage them while they're here or away, you are encouraging those who are in the darkest parts of the world. Where do your gifts fit into that? If you're not going, how are you using your gifts for this cause? My plea to God today is that none of us would walk out of this room and just go back to our easy, comfortable American lives without considering this call. We must be about this purpose if we want to be 
about the business of our Savior. I pray that none of us would be disobedient. No matter which of these two camps you fall into, goers or senders, there's one thing that all of us can do together, and that's pray. For those who are sent, for those who are risking their lives, for those who send for funds to be raised to support God's work, and for the shepherd to be glorified in saving his sheep. There is much cost to pursue this calling in our lives. There is much cost to pursue a life for the shepherd to bring his sheep into his fold. But that same shepherd paid an infinitely higher cost when he left the Father's right hand and entered humanity into a culture that was as far off from him as possible. And he suffered the wrath of God to save those people, to bring them into his fold. Infinitely higher cost. Mark 8.35 says this. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What a privilege to lose our lives for the gospel and this Christ. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us a shepherd that is immeasurably beyond words for how glorious and loving and caring he is as he saves his sheep. God, we are so honored that you would call us to partake in this mission to bring your sheep into your fold. I pray that we would be faithful to that calling, Lord. And as we just mentioned, Lord, we pray that you would call up people to go, even from the church at Southside, people to go, Lord, and that all of us would be equipping the saints and sending. God, please allow us to be faithful to this calling. Lord, as we come to the communion table now, I'm reminded of Christ's words to the disciples. He said, I will not drink the cup of this vine again until I am with you in my Father's kingdom. God, a day is coming where all of your sheep will be in your fold. All of us will be gathered together. Lord, we will partake of that cup with you in glory, and you will be glorified among the nations, and you will have a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation singing to you for all eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In your name we pray. Amen.